you know, there's a lot of people out there today. There's a lot of groups, uh, certainly the news media and, uh, and Hollywood and uh, video games, the internet, social media, all those avenues to reach the masses and the people that are trying to uh, cement and fortify the false and idea of the lie that uh, Jesus wasn't God. And I want to talk about that this morning. And In fact, I want to talk about if, if Jesus wasn't God, uh, how things would be different. And if he wasn't God, if you have a Bible, I'd ask you to open it up to Isaiah uh, 61. In verse 4, and you put that verse up on the screen, I have that uh, uh, ready to come up. Isaiah 61, verse 4. So many people today are trying to convince those who are not yet made their mind up, those who are on the fence that Jesus is not who he claimed to be, that he is not God. They will give... Uh, uh, credibility to the fact that he was a human and that he did walk this earth and that he did live, but he was nothing more than a man. In fact, we as Christians, we as believers who believe that Jesus was and is and always will be God, we are told that we need to embrace these other faiths, these other ideas, these other movements, and be a little bit more tolerant of them. And if you haven't faced that yet, I'm sure that you, you will before too long. Well, my stance on this is this. If Jesus was just a man, like all the other religion's founders, and not God, why then can we not pray in His name? And I would ask that question. Why can't we pray in His name? If, if He was just a man, what would it hurt to just pray in His name? You go to some big celebrations and, and some big events, be it a high school graduation, uh, whatever it is, they will allow a moment of silence for those in the audience to reflect to their God of their choosing to their higher power or even to Mother Earth, if it will. And if Jesus was a man and not God, I, I would ask this. If he, if he was merely a man as they are trying to convince, why can't, can't he be taught in school like Darwin? Why can't he be taught in school like the rest of people who were just men? Einstein, Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, John F. Kennedy. We see all these people who did great things on this earth who were just men. If Jesus was just a man, I would ask why can't he be taught in public school? If he was just a man who died some 2,000 years ago, why are so many people afraid of him in his name? Amen. Why are there so many people that struggle? They, they allow other religions. You can pray to God, but don't pray to God in Jesus' name. You can pray to Allah, but don't mention the name of Jesus. Uh, it's okay to celebrate Allah. It's okay to celebrate uh, Buddha, Muhammad, or even Joseph Smith on the 24th of July. Uh, it's okay to celebrate a pope. It's okay to even celebrate and worship Satan. But for some reason, in this nation especially, it's not okay to celebrate and worship Jesus. Uh, I'm kind of wondering why. Have you ever just said, I mean, why is Jesus so attacked? If he was just a man... If he was not God, if he was just a man, why is he under such a barrage of attacks and always have been? Why is it okay to celebrate the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah? Why can Ramadan be celebrated? Why can Halloween or Earth Day be untouched yet when it comes to Christmas or Easter? Anything that has to do with the cross of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, or the name of Jesus, it has to be taken out. Taken out of Walmart. Taken out of Toys R Us. Taken out of Best Buy. Taken out of everything. Jesus is being taken out of everything. Uh, the highway patrolmen here in the state of Utah had crosses put up honoring those who were slain in the line of duty. Even those crosses, there was a law passed that said those crosses have to be taken down. Why does God's word have to be removed from the judicial branches of government and the entities? What is it about the name of Jesus, the person of Jesus, or the idea of Jesus that makes so many people afraid, intimidated, and even offended? I mean, after all, those of you who know Jesus personally know that he came to save you. He came to set you free. He came to deliver you. He came to rescue you. Why would other people say you know, things and do things that, that are really a reaction of fear? I, I, I really believe that those very attacks are the very things that prove the authenticity that Jesus is God. 
Yes. No other person, no other name has come under attack since Jesus walked this earth some 2,000 years ago. I believe the answers are found in the life of Jesus and some things that He did. He told His disciples when they were asking Him, we want to see God. Jesus came as a representation to this earth of God in the flesh, dwelling with man. And many didn't get that, and even His disciples didn't understand that at first. And they said, would you show us the Father? And Jesus remarked and commented to them. He said, well, if you've seen Me, you have seen the Father. In other words, Jesus was declaring, I am the Father. I am God. God has come in, in, in My form. I have come here to be with you. Now, this is what it says in Psalms 14, verse 1. It says, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. I would go on to say, a fool will say in his heart that Jesus is not God. Can I get an amen? amen? That Jesus is not God. And just in case you missed that in the Psalms, it's repeated in Psalm 53, verse 1, word for word exactly. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Here's what I think is taking place as I set this whole thing out. I believe there is a conviction of righteousness that dwells in every single human being that has ever lived. There is a conviction of righteousness that dwells in all of us. And when we, we, we try to walk away from that right standing, that righteousness, that place we're supposed to be, I believe that we tend to do things to turn off that conviction. And I think this is where the world has gone. The world does not want to believe in Jesus. And the devil gets in there and creates confusion, distortion, and twists the truth. And so when people reject Jesus as God, what they're doing is trying to get secure in their own rebelliousness and not focus on that conviction of righteousness. Help me understand what I'm saying. Yeah. We, they reject Jesus because they don't want to have to face that righteous conviction that's inside of them. So they figure if they reject Him long enough, they can push Him out and they can get rid of Him. And here's the solution, church, and I want you to listen to this. The solution is us doing our part. It is us living for Jesus. It is us proclaiming and believing that Jesus is God. Living a transparent life. Living the good news of the gospel of Jesus in our daily living. Listen, too often I think the problem is this. Many people, uh, all all believers are called to preach and live the good news, yet so many are focusing on the bad news instead. Come on. Instead of walking in the life of abundant living in Jesus, they're walking in the life of complaint and, and, and lack and noticing all that's going wrong in the world, all that's going wrong in the church. You know, we look around here today, many probably looked at this room and thought, where is the church? Everybody's gone. See, we have this natural tendency to lean to looking toward the negative. I'm rejoicing that you're here. I'm rejoicing that we got 20 people in here. Come on. I'm rejoicing that the church has people in it. Come on. Yet we have this tendency to go, well, where is so-and-so? Where is this family? Where is that going? We tend to lean to the negative. We've been called to preach the good news. Not focus on the bad news. Can I get an amen? amen? That's what we're called to do. Hallelujah. Some people get so lost in the negative, they actually start to grow fond of it. How many of you have family members or friends or relatives or co-workers? They love to rejoice in the negative. They love to focus on that which is wrong. And they, they like magnify it. And, they, and, and we tend to kind of get caught in that if we aren't careful. Some people, you know, they, they, they love the negative and the wrath and the bad and, and all of that. There's, when there's so much good going on in the world, and there really, really is, mm -hmm. there's so much good that God is wanting us to partake in, why would we find ourselves wanting to get wrapped up in the bad? Mm -hmm. There are people out there that believe that God is angry. And they live their life like God is angry. I'm here to tell you, God is not angry. Come on, God is rejoicing because He has a bride on this earth that He is developing and He is transforming and He is adding to His kingdom daily. I want to tell you this and I want you to get this. Whatever God is to you on the inside, listen, whatever God is to you, on the inside of your heart, that's what's going to come out in your action. If you find yourself being negative, I'm here to tell you, you're looking at God as being a negative God. If you're, if you're always looking for the, the, the sad, the tragic, the, the misery, the bad, the, the destruction, that's because that's who God is to you. When you get a vision and a revelation of who God truly is, and God is not negative, amen. God is not angry. God is not out to destroy. God has come to save, to seek and save that which is lost. And when you get that on the 
the inside. That's what's going to come out of you. And you'll be a person who can find the good no matter what it is that is going on around you. Amen. Jesus, who, listen, whoever Jesus is to you is who Jesus is going to be to you. Whatever Jesus is to you is who Jesus is going to be to you. The problem is so many people have been taught the wrong thing from pulpit so long that they look at God in the wrong light. They look at Jesus as in the negative light. Whoever Jesus is to you is who He's going to be through you. Whoever He is to you is how He's going to come out of you. I can tell what Jesus is to a believer on how they react to believers and how they react to non-believers and how they react to circumstances, good or bad. You can tell what Jesus means to them by how He comes out of them in any set of circumstances. I want to say this. <clears throat> walking in the Gospel, walking to, the Gospel means good news. Come on. Walking in the gospel. When I say that, I mean walking in the good news. Living with the right attitude. Living with a mindset that God is in control. And that God can change any circumstance or any situation. Whatever He wants to. In but a moment, God can come in and change and save your unsaved loved one. When we walk in the gospel of Jesus. I want to tell you something. Walking in the gospel of Jesus or walking in the good news is not always easy. Because there is a lot of negative going on there that's trying to get in on top of you. Come on. Walking in the gospel of Jesus is not for whims. People think that Christians churches are full of people who just want an easy way. I want to tell you after walking in the gospel for some 20 years, it's not easy always to walk in the good news because there are people out there trying to get you to look at the bad news. There are people out there trying to bring you down. Can somebody say amen? There are people out there throwing stuff at you, hurling stuff at you, purging stuff from you, just trying to always bring you to where they're at so that they can feel better about about themselves. It takes strong faith to walk in good news. Can I get an amen? It takes a lot of faith to be a believer. It takes no faith at all to come to church and have some sort of religion. It doesn't take faith to do that. All you got to do is have some sort of a conviction going on in for some sense of moral acceptance. And you can just go to church, whatever church it is. Let me give you a quote. Eleanor Roosevelt said, uh, years ago, she said, great minds discuss great events. Or I, I'm sorry, great minds discuss great ideas. Average minds discuss events. And small minds discuss people. Can I say that again? Small minds discuss people. How many of you have small-minded people around you? They love talking, and, and most of the time when they talk about people, come on. We call that gossip. I know, some people call it prayer chain. We call it gossip. Small minds discuss people. Average minds discuss events. They get caught up in the events of the day, the news, or whatever. But great minds discuss ideas. And I'm here to tell you that Christ took and gave us a biblical idea of revival. Come on. Of restoration. And he believed in it. And he wants us as his church to believe in it. I believe we can speak over this city. Yes. And I believe we can prophesy to Beaver, Utah, or Cedar City, or Parowan, or wherever you call home. I believe we can speak to our city and believe that Jesus is going to restore it. Isaiah